Hello, welcome to the Association for Diplomatic Studies and Trainings Virtual Diplomatic Lunch Discussion. Just wanted to mention this is our first time running the ADST Virtual Diplomatic Lunch Discussion via Zoom. My name is Mark Rincon. I'm an active duty FSO with ADST, and I'll serve today as a moderator for our discussion. As part of ADST's mission to capture, preserve, and share the history of America's diplomats, this series features policy experts and authors who have a connection with us. To learn more about, about ADST and to support our efforts, please visit ADST.org for more information. So today we're really delighted to have with us uh, Andrew Imbri, who is no stranger to the Foreign Service life. He grew up in the Foreign Service family. Uh, his, he's the son of an FSO uh, professionally. He served on Capitol Hill as a professional staff member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And at the Department of State, he was a speechwriter and a foreign policy advisor to the former Secretary of State, uh, John Kerry. He's worked at the Carnegie Endowment, and he's now a senior fellow at his alma mater, uh, Georgetown University, at the Center for Security and Emerging Technologies. For more information on Andrew's background, uh, go to his website, andrewimbree.com, to learn more. Uh, Andrew, we're very glad to have you join us. We know you have a, a, a serious background in national security and foreign affairs. And Andrew's new book, uh, Power on the Precipice, The Six Choices America Faces in a Turbulent World, is both a timely book and a very relevant one. The book delves into history, it analyzes the rise and fall of nations, and how lessons learned from the past can be applied to the challenges America faces today. So it's something near and dear to our hearts with ADST. So perhaps maybe the one pertinent question on our minds uh, amongst the many is, is America headed for decline as a great power? Can it recover? Uh, you know, it may seem as if the United States is either destined for continued dominance or doomed to irreversible decline. In, in the book, Andrew argues that instead, the United States must adapt to changing global dynamics and compete more wisely. So the question is, where do we go from here? I'm sure we're in for a very insightful discussion, and I'd now, now like to invite Andrew to uh, open the conversation. Over to you. Well Super, this is uh, a real delight to be here with you, Mark, uh, and with the ADST community. Uh, as you said, I grew up a foreign service brat. My father was a foreign service officer, so it's always uh, special for me to have a chance to speak with uh, the diplomatic community. Uh, and I always remember, uh, you know, living, bouncing around from country to country as a kid uh, and marveling at, at the work that our diplomats do. And then Many years later, when I got to serve in the State Department myself and travel the world, uh, it was really a privilege to, to visit embassies all over the world and to see the incredible work, the bravery, and the sense of mission uh, that really uh, carries through and everything that our foreign service, civil servants, locally employed staff, and everybody up and down the line do for the country. So I'm really, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, it's a really, I think, timely moment to be talking about America's future place in the world. And what I thought I'd do in just a few brief minutes at the top before we go into questions is to share a little bit about why I wanted to write the book, why now, and why, why is it so urgent at this moment, and then share a, a story about one particular choice in the book that I think will have special relevance for, for this audience. Uh, so let me just say that, you know, when I was, a, uh, when I was on the policy planning staff at the State Department, uh, one, of my, one of my jobs was to think about how do you tell America's story to the world and how do you translate the world's many stories to Americans back home? And back in the fall of 2013, uh, my colleagues and I who were, who were thinking about this on the policy planning staff were helping Secretary Kerry get ready for a big trip to the Asia Pacific. And this was an effort to try to cement President Obama's multifaceted rebalance to Asia. And so there were a whole series of engagements and speeches as part of this effort. And right in the middle of this trip, uh, there was a crisis. And the crisis wasn't emanating from abroad. It came from the home front. Uh, it was really a crisis of our own making. Our government shut down. And we had to furlough many of our employees. 
uh, and many went to work uh, without pay. Uh, and this was a real, a real crisis, not only domestically, but also for our standing in the world. Uh, and as a writer, I was thinking about how to convey this message. And all of the speech writers who were working on the policy planning staff started to look at the global headlines. And what we saw was pretty troubling. In our major allies, uh, the UK, for example, said that we had done grave damage to our reputation. Other, other allies like Germany and South Korea said that we shouldn't be holding our citizens and the global economy hostage. And what was so interesting about these statements was not that they were targeting any one political party or politician. It wasn't about any single poll. It was really about America's credit and credibility in the world. And the shutdown really did have an impact. It had a near-term impact in that we had to shutter our doors to students and refugees who looked to America as the last best hope. We had to delay uh, trade negotiations with the Europeans, security assistance to vital allies around the world. Uh, we furloughed uh, scientists who are working to push the curve of discovery. So there were a whole host of costs associated with the shutdown. But I think the costs went further than that. And they've only enveloped our country even more since then. And for me, one of the most concerning as someone who cares about our foreign policy is that the polarization that we're seeing in our country makes it awfully difficult to come up with bipartisan agreement on major foreign policy issues, which means that we tend to see wild swings from one administration to the next. When you're as polarized as we are, when you're divided at home, then it's awfully difficult to make promises, but it's even harder to keep them. It's hard to draw lessons learned from our recent foreign policy successes and failures. It's also difficult to come up with a sensible approach to negotiations that isn't an all or nothing approach. Uh, and it's even more difficult to have what I think is so necessary right now, which is a serious public debate about the choices facing America in a, in a much more turbulent world. And so that's really what I tried to do with this book is lay out in a, in a sort of broad macroscopic way, what are the six choices that, that America faces? And I'd like to just quickly walk through them and then zero in on one of them. So the first choice is, is called core or periphery. And this is really a choice about where, when, and how America employs military force. Should it intervene in faraway lands? If so, under what terms, with what partners, and to what ends? Uh, and this is a really difficult choice. Uh, the core and the periphery are sometimes defined differently by our allies and partners. And while I take a skeptical look at these interventions in my book, I also recognize that if we leave problems festering uh, in the periphery, uh, they can come back and, and hurt us in our homelands. So I really put an emphasis on preventative diplomacy and development to try to attend to the root causes of some of these problems. And I hope we can get into this in the Q&A. And as part of this chapter, I tell the story of a leader, uh, a soldier who was deployed to Afghanistan and really wrestled with this choice firsthand. And then I also look back to history and ask, well, how have other uh, countries fared when they've intervened in Afghanistan? And I look at the Soviet intervention in Afghanistan at the time. And for every chapter, I do the same. I wrestle with a difficult strategic choice. And then I try to tell that choice through the eyes of a leader and then look to history for lessons learned. So the second choice is butter or guns. And, and this is really a question of where a country invests its resources. Given that national aspirations can be unlimited, but resources are limited, it's the challenge of statecraft to try to reconcile the two. And butter and guns is really a perennial debate for a great power. Should you invest more in education, infrastructure, science and technology to shore up your country's innovation base? Or should you be investing more in military hardware and software, new platforms and personnel? This isn't really an either or choice. It's, a, it's about setting the balance between these two. It's about negotiating trade-offs. Uh, and so in this, in this chapter, I make the case for, for a new resilience and innovation agenda in the United States, which can also lay the groundwork for our long-term military power. The next choice is allies or autonomy. And, and I'd like to say a little bit more about this choice in a moment, but it really comes down to should America cement its alliances, its friendships in the world, uh, or should it try to cut allies loose, maximize its flexibility and conserve resources and pursue a more unilateral path? Uh, and in this chapter, I tell the story of one of our great diplomats. And I also look back to, to history to the Habsburg Empire to see how they actually used 
uh, alliance diplomacy to their advantage. Uh, and where I come down is very much on the side of uh, it's important to really cement and adapt our alliances uh, for a new era. The next choice uh, is, is called uh, co coercion or persuasion. And this is really an approach about how a country manages the rise of other peer competitors. In this case, how do we manage a country like China's rise? Uh, and I think there's some important lessons uh, from history. I look at how the British managed a rising America in the 19th and early 20th century. And I tell the story in this chapter of another one of our intrepid diplomats who helped negotiate uh, an agreement with one of, uh, one of our most difficult uh, regional competitors uh, in, the nor in Northeast Asia. The next chapter uh, deals with the choice of people power or pinstripe rule. Uh, and this is really a question about governance, good governance, and how do you deal with what we're seeing more and more today, which is the strategic use of networks of corruption. Uh, and this has got to be a, a central question for a great power, because as I, as I show in the book, in history, time and again, we've seen great powers fall because their institutions erode and decay, and good governance is sacrificed uh, on the altar of, of personal or near-term interests. And so it's so important to get this question right. And the leader that I port uh, portray in the book is a scholar and anti-corruption activist who has a remarkable uh, story in her own right. Uh, she, she was in Afghanistan right after the, the intervention, helped set up a soap cooperative, uh, learned Pashto, was trying to give back uh, to the people there. But she also witnessed firsthand the way in which corruption wasn't just a reflection of the growing insurgency, but a, a driver of it. And she began to connect the dots and see that corruption really, this, this issue was spanning the globe. Uh, it was part of sort of a global problem. And we've seen that in recent years with the protests uh, against, against corruption. And so this is really a central question. And I look back to history for, for guidance uh, to the Ottoman Empire in the 17th century uh, and, and some warnings for today about, about the integrity of institutions. The last choice is open or closed. And I think this is really the big debate happening today, especially in many uh, Western democracies. But this is sort of a debate we used to have between left and right. And now we're seeing a debate between open and closed about how you support global economic arrangements that reinforce and strengthen a middle class. How do you negotiate trade agreements uh, forge rules of the road for international relations, but do so in a way that's sustainable, that protects our environment, and that helps our workers and our middle class uh, adapt and stay competitive in a fast-changing world. And if there's one lesson I've learned from the last couple of years, it's that we have to have a foreign policy that works for the middle class. It has to enjoy broad public support to be sustainable. So those are the, those are the six big choices that I lay out in the book. Let me just share a little bit more about one of those choices, which is allies or autonomy, because I really do think, uh, especially for our diplomats uh, and, you know, who, are, who are working this uh, issue at home and, and with our partners and allies in the world, it's so important. So one of the people that I profile in the book is Ambassador Nicholas Burns, who was our permanent representative to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization on September 11th, uh, NATO. And when the, when the tragedy struck, uh, Ambassador Burns put in a call to our then National Security Advisor and said, uh, you know, the Allies want to invoke NATO's mutual defense clause, its Article 5 clause, and I need the President's permission. And as I spoke with Nick, I realized this was a call that he was really born to make. You know, he grew up in Boston uh, as the son of greatest generation parents. Uh, and when he was 17, uh, the Vietnam War was just coming to a close. President Nixon had negotiated a peace agreement, but peace seemed more elusive than ever. And uh, Ambassador Burns talked to me about how uh, the Vietnam conflict, the tragedy of this conflict, burrowed into to his community and every community across the country. It was part of family dinner table conversations. And it really reminded him that uh, war is the failure of diplomacy. Uh, and sometimes, like in World War II, you need to fight. But there are times when you need to settle differences by other means, and that's diplomacy. And one of the lessons that Nick drew away from his own study of history was that our allies are an enormous comparative advantage for America in a fast-changing world. And he knew this, especially going into the tragedy of 9-11 and the diplomacy that happened thereafter. Right on that morning uh, uh, of 9-11, the Canadian permanent representative to NATO 
I turned to Nick and said, have you thought about invoking Article 5 so we can stand in solidarity with you, with America? And Nick knew the irony of that, of that situation because it was always assumed that if uh, Article 5 were ever invoked, it would be for America to come back to Europe to support Europeans. Uh, and instead, what happened was the Europeans were ready to rise up uh, to stand with America. And it was, it was a moving moment. Uh, Ambassador Burns briefed the North Atlantic Council and said that it could, this could be the, the bloodiest uh, day in American history since the Battle of Antietam in our civil war. And to a person, our allies were ready to stand with us. And when America woke up uh, on September 12th, they got to see the news that the NATO alliance was standing with us. And they've stood with us for many years thereafter, uh, making enormous sacrifices in Afghanistan and elsewhere uh, to support our shared democratic values. And when I, when I talked to Nick and when I thought about his story, one of the big lessons for America is, well, what are we gonna do with this great heritage of our alliances that we forged during the Cold War, that adapted in the post-Cold War period? Uh, what, are they, what are we gonna make of them today? And I really believe that what we need is not just to restore uh, our, you know, our standing, the credibility of our commitments, we need to reinvent and reimagine our alliances for a new era for a whole host of new challenges where no country can solve them on its own. So the first, the first lesson I take away is that our allies are net assets, not liabilities. Power without consent, without legitimacy isn't sustainable. And our, our democratic partners and allies are a crucial source of legitimacy in the world, of burden sharing, uh, and, they're, and they're so important, but we have to recognize their importance first as a matter of, of priority. Uh, once we do that, I think we need to have the conversation about what's a modernized agenda look like for our alliances. I think some of that is, is being creative about what burden sharing looks like, uh, thinking about how we can co-develop uh, capabilities that are modernized, that are fit for purpose today. How can we think about multinational force planning so that NATO really can operate at the speed of relevance? Uh, how do we think about values uh, in the context of NATO today? And how do we stand up for, for democratic values? Uh, what's more, we need to think about big challenges like China, uh, like cyber, and like resilience. I think one of, the, one of the key lessons from COVID has been that democracies need to bolster their resilience and their economic competitiveness at home. There's a role for, for NATO in that conversation, I believe. Uh, there's also a role for the European Union and other organizations, since resilience encompasses a multifaceted agenda. So part of the lesson about adaptation is how do we make sure that NATO is meeting new challenges, challenges that often fall beneath the threshold of military conflict, below Article 5. How do we make sure that our deterrence is credible and that we're standing up for our shared values? There are two other lessons that I just share about our alliances. One is that they need to have a strong basis of domestic support. I think if you look at the historical record, one of the, one of the lessons is that sometimes domestic support for alliances can fray. And so you have to tend the garden at home as well as abroad. You need to make sure that we're telling the story of our alliances and of our diplomacy effectively to the American people so that they know all the good work that we're doing and how important our alliances are uh, in terms of safeguarding our values uh, in, the, in the world today. Uh, and what I've seen, I think, that we, we, is that there is a broad basis of support for our alliances. But there are also partisan divisions over the degree to which we should be compromising with our allies and taking their interests into account. And we, we simply can't let our alliances become the plaything of partisan politics. They have to be, there has to be strong domestic support for them. So we have to tell that story effectively. And the last lesson I just share is that I do think we're, we're in a global world right now and democracies need to stick together. I've always believed that the strength of our democracy at home is inextricably linked to our ability to be a, a force for progress in the world. And democracies do need to stick together, which means I think we need to explore new cooperative frameworks, new strategies that reach out to allies, both in Europe and in the Indo-Pacific and bring those, those allies together in conversation about shared threats, but also new opportunities on the horizon. So I think there, there's a big agenda for our alliances today. And one of the lessons from history that I'll just share is from Franklin Roosevelt who in his fourth inaugural address quoted the writer Ralph Waldo Emerson in saying, the only way to have a friend is to be one. And I think after 9-11, as Ambassador Burns saw, we had many friends in the world. And the question is, can we say the same today? You know, is America a good friend? And we have to think about 
how we are positioning ourselves in the world with our partners and with our allies to meet a whole new set of challenges. So I'm really uh, excited to talk with, with the community here and with, with all of you tuning in. Uh, it can be a more uh, important, I think, conversation to be having. Uh, and I hope the book makes a small contribution to that debate. So thanks a lot for tuning in. Excellent. No, thank you so much, Andrew, for, for taking the time for those thoughts. Uh, the book is, is extremely timely as well, in addition to being relevant, given that I, I and I'll invite anyone who wants to ask questions, please use the Q&A function uh, or the raise hand function if you have. I think we'll have a question from Dan Whitman momentarily, but I, I just wanted to follow on a bit uh, to ask, uh, how much does it matter uh, without opening Pandora's box <laughs> regarding uh, the, the, we're five days away from an election. There's talk about perhaps it being something that's contested. Um, how much does it matter uh, which administration is in office in 2021 and beyond, given that you've, you've mentioned the, the need to strengthen the alliances to be a good friend. Uh, how do you see the, the roadmap for for American leadership, uh, given the, the increasingly polarized nature that we have at home? Thanks for the question. I, you know, I, I would say point number one is that the power of our example is just as important, if not more important than the example of our power. And that means that we have to make sure that our democracy is still an example for the world. And it needs to be, to be more resilient, more innovative, and we need to stand by our values. I think in the context of elections, free and fair elections and the peaceful transfer of power are, are, are part of our tradition. And it's, it's a really important message that we send the world. So much of, I think, world events, so much of what uh, we're seeing today requires us to be strong at home. And so I think it, it really, the conversation has to start there. In terms of what we can see and what we can expect, and I certainly can't speak for, for either campaign and I, I'm humble about uh, making, making predictions, especially what we've seen the last couple of months with COVID. We, we know that exogenous shocks can come out of, out of nowhere. We need to do a much better job of preparing for them. Uh, but we're in the fog of crisis still right now. So a lot could change. But my sense is that you know, we know uh, from the Trump administration, we've seen uh, the patterns over the last couple of years. And I think we, we can expect to see more of that uh, in the coming years if uh, President Trump were reelected and perhaps a deepening and an acceleration in a number of areas. So a more of an emphasis on bilateral approaches over multilateral approaches, a more of a focus on metrics like manufacturing, uh, more of a focus on, on burden sharing uh, or even burden shedding and, and reciprocity. And we, we've seen that and we know the patterns. Uh, what can we expect if President, uh, Vice President Biden were elected? I think there you would see, uh, based on his record, someone who is deeply committed to alliances uh, and a deeply committed transatlanticist who will try to reinvent and reimagine our alliances for a new era, but also challenge allies to, to make those changes with us. I think that's going to be one of the conversations that will really matter is that the tone matters, our outreach to alliances matters, our, our, our pursuit of cooperation matters, and then allies will also have to step up and recognize the new geopolitical realities at play and make those hard choices. I think another uh, topic that will be really important that I think a Vice President Biden would emphasize as president is making sure that foreign policy works uh, for the middle class uh, and making sure that it's attending to issues that are of concern to allies around the world, which means democratic renewal, you know, embracing our values, uh, focusing on climate change and inequality. I think all of these are issues that that plague democracies around the world, but it also can be part of an affirmative agenda. And I think that's gonna be really important because we do need to lead with our values uh, and we need to be able to lead in a way that brings other allies along. I think that mutual admiration and historically has been so important for America. It reduces the cost of all of our actions all around the world. And so I do think we need to recover that sense of, of shared purpose, which means bringing our allies into conversation early on, thinking about how they see these issues and what issues matter to them as well as to us and finding that point of common interest. And I do think the best part of our tradition has been enlightened self-interest and common problem solving. And I think you very much see that from a Vice President Biden. And I think to me, the big challenges that await us require us to be 
strong as a democracy at home, and then to recognize that we really cannot solve any of these big challenges uh, that, I, that I write about in the book or that, that we talk about every day unless we're doing it uh, in concert with other allies and partners. And I just think that's going to require, require a cooperative approach from America uh, and a willingness uh, from allies to step up and invest in our relationship too. So uh, hopefully we can, we can see that uh, in the months and years to come. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you for that. And I, I think we'll uh, now move on to uh, our first question from Dan Whitman. Um, Andrew, congratulations on this great book. I've read as much as you can prior to the official publication. It's a, it's a great analysis of the six options that you mentioned. And I remember uh, very gratefully a briefing you gave at State Department to PD officers some years ago, ethos, pathos, logos. Uh, this is the principles you used in uh, drafting speeches for Secretary Kerry. I now, that's now at the top of what I try to teach in my courses to uh, successor generation people at AU. And welcome to Mark. I once used to sit in your seat. That was some years ago. My question is about the future of the wisdom that we may look to. Uh, prior to your book, Andrew, there was Bob Gates, Exercise of Power. Some years ago, David Ignatius, America and the World, where he interviewed Brzezinski and Scowcroft. We have lost Brzezinski and Scowcroft. We still have Bob Gates, uh, who says, quoting a World War II general, never fight unless you have to, never fight alone, and never fight for long. I think that's, those are very good principles to go by. My question is, who can we look to now that we've lost Brzezinski and Scowcroft? And yes, I was in Brussels with Nick Burns, 10 days after 9-11, when he uh, had a meeting with PD officers at the time, he was a visionary uh, and he is a visionary. Um, who do you see taking the place of that generation, uh, possibly Gates, possibly Bill Burns, possibly Nick Burns, possibly John Kerry? Who is it do you think we can look to um, as the senior practitioners who can pass on to us the wisdom of their predecessors. Thanks so much, both, both for, for your read of the book, uh, for remembering, I'm very impressed that you remember, uh, remember our engagements back, uh, back in the State Department uh, and, and for your great question. You know, my, my sense is, uh, let, me, let me step back from any one individual and just share, share a few thoughts about this because I think it's really important. I think the first is that there's a lot of, of good things happening at the local level around the country. Uh, people who, who may live quiet lives in, in terms of the media spotlight, but who are doing incredible work on the ground to reimagine uh, health delivery, to, to support uh, civic engagement and renewal, to support uh, new forms of, of education and outreach, uh, to help bridge the income divides in the country. I, I really do think there are there's just uh, quiet leadership uh, in local uh, in localities across the country. Uh, and I think it's really important that we recognize that, tell those stories uh, and help bring them together, help build those networks, and then try to figure out a way to, to bring the good work that's happening at the local level to our national level where, where there are so many problems and so much gridlock. So I think that would be point number one. The second is I think a lot of what AT ADST does is really important, which is we need to think about how to, how to capture uh, the wisdom of, of the leaders that we've had, uh, commemorate it, think about the stories, making sure that we're using our narrative capacities effectively as a country. Uh, one of the things that I uh, realized in writing this book is how much of our diplomacy uh, happens every day, but it's invisible. And sometimes good diplomacy has to be that way because it rests on counterfactuals, on the things that, that didn't happen. So, on the food security crises that didn't break out or on the arms races that didn't happen or the, the human trafficking that, that never occurred because we made the right investments and we were engaged. And so a lot of that puts a premium on telling stories and on, being, on having those conversations uh, domestically. And we need to be able to share that with Americans to help build that natural support because uh, you know, the State Department doesn't have a natural constituency the way that, say, the Defense Department does. So it really means that that story matters using simple language, uh, building it around the incredible uh, 
heroism uh, and characters that I, I certainly saw at the State Department. I think there's a good story to tell there. Uh, we just have to make sure that we, we care about it and preserve it because I think a lot of that uh, wisdom is gonna matter. And the next is that I just think this, this tells me that talent is so important. Uh, it's one of those issues, workforce development, that, that often gets overlooked, but, but you really can't separate talent from institutional capacity, from management, from the policy leadership that you need. Uh, and there's a whole host of really good things happening uh, on talent right now. I've been particularly more involved on the tech side of talent uh, based on what the, the work of my organization at Georgetown, the Center for Security and Emerging Technology. And I think on this question of talent, uh, there's so much we could be doing to, to invest uh, in STEM talent in K through 12, uh, to, to support and reimagine uh, liberal arts for a new era that helps people adapt much more effectively. And then thinking about our, our workforce renovation strategies uh, and talent strategies for our national security agencies today. I think some of that means building uh, mentorship networks between our senior leaders and emerging leaders. Uh, and some of it means thinking about how we're going to invest uh, in our workforce of the future so that it can adapt to a much more competitive landscape. So there are many uh, individual heroes, uh, I think around the country that we could look to, but I think even more important is thinking about how we build an ecosystem that supports the transfer of that knowledge and learning from one generation to the next. I think if you look at the great stories of innovation in America, they often happen that way. They happen when government, academia, and universities work together, and they happen when one generation can consolidate the wisdom and pass it on to the next so that they can build on it. Uh, and I think those bigger systemic questions are really important to get right, especially now. Yeah, thank you for that answer. And thank you, Dan, for the question. It was a good question. Uh, we do have another one uh, from Jeremy. Hey, Andrew. Uh, my name is Jeremy. I'm a career foreign service officer. Thanks for uh, joining this group today and for writing uh, your book, which is exceptional. Um, one item that you raise in the book is that um, a lot of the department's success uh, is sort of captured in counterfactuals, things that the State Department or Foreign Service officers helped prevent or make better than they would have otherwise been. Uh, how, how, how do we tell the story of diplomacy better? Because um, we're clearly not doing a, a good enough job of, of sort of telling that story. Um, and sort of just to piggyback onto what you just said, you know, this ecosystem of sort of talent management um, and, and, you know, sort of uh, passing information and um and and sort of uh, career methodology from one generation to the next seems to be sort of broken at the state department and that's been exacerbated by the departure of um so many senior level folks at the state department leaving a real gap in that transmission from one generation to the next how do we go about sort of addressing that issue institutionally so that we are not hobbled uh, for the next generation um, in terms of sort of executing internationally um, just when uh, the institution of the State Department sort of needs leadership the most? Great questions. I, I mean, I think the, I, I really agree with the sort of the thrust of how important it is to tell these stories effectively. So I'm glad you asked that. You know, my sense is I, you know, I don't have, uh, I'm not going to have a, a perfect answer for this, but there are a couple of principles that I see that are really important, especially if you're trying to tell good stories about counterfactuals, about things that didn't happen. The, the first I just say is that it really is important to use a simple language. Uh, one of President Reagan's speechwriters uh, used to say that uh, big ideas are often best expressed in the smallest words. And if you think about some of the fundamental truths that you might have expressed in your life, they're always simple. Uh, and it doesn't mean you're being simplistic, it just means that you're, you're speaking the truth plainly. And I think that that's really important to reach people effectively. So stripping away the jargon uh, of our language, which matters as a term of art for other insiders, but it really can constrain effective communication with the broader public. So that's number one. Number two is getting out there and speaking more and going beyond the Acela corridor, going beyond sort of the usual places that we might speak and reaching out to places like libraries to, to uh, different communities uh, around the country in different parts of the country, not just on election day or around elections, but all the time throughout the year, because I really do think we need to tell that story in a way that connects to the gut instincts and the concerns of people 
uh, in communities around the country, which leads me to my next point, which is I think we have to find a way to tell the story that connects to those day-to-day -day concerns. So if people are buying their products at a store, they want to make sure that, that those products aren't made with, with human slavery, with trafficking. Uh, and we've got diplomats and development experts who are working on that day to day. You know, we care about uh, opening markets for our businesses. Well, we've got we've got people working on that too. We want to make sure that a piece of malware doesn't come across our borders and, and cripple our businesses. You know, we we do work on that at the State Department and across the government. Uh, you know, you want to make sure that uh, that a pandemic doesn't doesn't arise uh, and then shut down an economy. Uh, there are a whole host of of ways that we can try to convey. Uh, what the threats are overseas and how our diplomats get ahead of them and how wise investments in diplomacy really are a great bargain on the dollar. But beyond just threats, I do think we need to also talk about opportunities. We have to talk about how we're proactively shaping a more secure, a more just and more inclusive world. And I think tangible examples, stories from the front lines are the best way to do that. As a speechwriter, one of the things that I loved doing was uh, if, if Secretary Kerry was about to travel to post we would always try to find out stories uh, of people uh, in the field who are working on these issues on food security, on the empowerment of women, on, uh, on arms control issues, and we could always find them. There was always somebody there. And I think building stories around characters, around individuals to the extent you can, and respecting you know, their privacy, it's really important because it helps people grab onto the story and remember. And I found more often than not in a speech, what the audience would remember was not the policy you were announcing or the numbers and figures. It was a story that left them feeling a different way about, about the country or the world or a set of issues. Uh, and so I think that that will be uh, really important. In terms of the, of the department, uh, you know, we really have seen uh, you know, a slowdown in intake. We've seen an exodus of senior leadership. I think 60% of our career ambassadors at the State Department have left, and you're right, that puts a tremendous amount of pressure uh, on the mid-levels, and it also makes it hard to try to make we make sure we transfer that that knowledge and wisdom. I think there are are good initiatives happening uh, in the nonprofit sectors, uh, in the think tank and academic sectors uh, that are trying to conserve and preserve uh, and carry this wisdom forward. I think this is an area where the the State Department could get creative and think about these public-private partnerships, think about outreach to the different communities who are trying to harness this wisdom. And then we can think about how we do our training, uh, both at the sort of the A100 level to the, the CONAL professional skills requirements in the State Department uh, to FSI. I think there's a lot of resources that the State Department has, a lot of good people working on these issues who care about preserving uh, knowledge for the future. I think we, we have to have the political will to make it happen and the institutional structures uh, to connect it. So I do think that this outreach to, to the nonprofit sector and to trying to conserve from our ambassadors and DCMs, and also the many people who left at the at the mid level, who really have a lot to share as well. Uh, and so I do I do think that we have to just focus on this as a priority, understanding that building a a diplomatic workforce for the future has to be a, a central priority of our foreign policy. Thank you for the question, Jeremy, and thank you, Andrew, for that answer. I think it brings up an important point of what we do at ADST is to try and help tell those stories of American diplomacy and of diplomats. Uh, when we go overseas and we're exposed internationally, we have a chance to really see the country from, uh, from their eyes, from a different set of eyes, and also represent the United States. I'd like to follow on, if I could, um, uh, on that point about, you know, we have hometown diplomats, we have public diplomacy, but in a sense, uh, this notion of personal diplomacy uh, is one that might be intriguing. And I'd like to ask you a little bit about, given you know, your background, you, you grew up with parents in the Foreign Service, you grew up living in, in international life uh, with journalism, uh, lots of international travel and exposure, and all of that helped shape who you are. I'm wondering what role do you see or what role should foreign affairs play in helping inform and educate the American public more broadly. Of course, you know, those on the call here, we all have a connection to whether it be foreign affairs, the foreign service, the State Department, but in terms of just uh, the country as a whole, the average everyday American, what role do you see international affairs playing in, and how could we collectively do a better job of, of uh, helping inform on that level? 
I mean, I think this question of, of education in foreign affairs is, is really important. You mentioned the Hometown Diplomats uh, Program, we have innovation roadshows, we have diplomats in residence and colleges uh, and universities across the country. Uh, there's been talk about sort of a diplomatic reserve corps uh, of people who've, who've served already. I think there are a lot of interesting ideas out there about how the, the talent that we have that's already served and how we can bring that to bear to educate the wider public about the work that we do uh, in foreign policy. I think what we're seeing uh, today more than ever is, is that a lot of issues are interconnected at the domestic and international levels. It's really hard to separate them given the networks of interdependence that we've seen, given how fast everything is moving. And so I think it has to be part of sort of the citizen's education is how does, how does he or she navigate the world? And it's going to be part of people's lives, uh, you know, irrespective of the choices that they make, you know, whether you're going into business or philanthropy or you're working on inequality at home, you know, so much uh, of the challenge of inequality at home is also related to some of the policies that we're pursuing overseas. I mean, take trade, for example. I think it's really important that we set the rules of the road for international trade. America is good at this. Uh, we have allies and partners to help set the rules of the road. I think these can help uh, protect our values and also support our economy and our jobs. And so this is really important. But we have to make sure on questions of trade that we're bringing the right interests to the table. So we have to have sure, sure have the, the big multinationals there, but we also need uh, small, small businesses. We need labor. We need environmental groups. We need a whole diversity of interests represented at the table. And then we also need to think about how we do transition adjustment assistance. I think too often, uh, you know, we sort of separate these two conversations. We, we make the big trade deals and then we figure out how to, how to help the people who've fallen behind. We need to be thinking about that first. We need to be thinking about how to train and, and support our workforce so that it's ready to take advantage of these trade agreements and to compete effectively. We also need to think about how do we enforce these rules effectively. I think there's a whole set of conversations about enforcement. And of course, we've got to talk about uh, international tax policy, you know, make sure that we, uh, that there aren't um, loopholes uh, and ways for, for companies to avoid paying taxes, which are really important for uh, governments to use to help build the skills of people who feel that competitive pressure and who may be left behind. So there's a whole set of conversations about uh, foreign policy that really impact people at home. Climate change is another example. You know, there's conversations now in Europe about a sort of a carbon border adjustment uh, issue where you sort of look at what uh, goods are made and how much, how carbon intensive they are. This is an example where American engagement internationally uh, can have an impact about uh, how trade happens. Uh, and one of the things that I think is so promising for the country that ties foreign and domestic policy together is climate leadership. It's, it's an existential issue. It's also an opportunity for America. We have an opportunity to, to forge an energy, clean energy innovation agenda that will create uh, many, many new jobs for the country. And then it's, if you, you know, believe in this country's innovation potential like I do, I think this is an area where we can really excel on solar, on wind, on batteries, on a whole host of, of other areas. Uh, but we have to make the right investments in R&D. Uh, and we have to make sure that we're investing in, in the workforce to be able to take advantage of this. So again, climate inequality, you can run the list. There are a whole host of issues that bridge the foreign and domestic. And I do think it's in our interest that to have our diplomats, our trade representatives, you know, speak across the country all year round, uh, resources permitting to really have these conversations with people so they realize how important this work is and so that we build that constituency for the State Department so that they can get the budgets, the resources, the, the FTEs, the personnel that they need uh, to do their jobs effectively. Because as anyone who's worked in the State Department knows, you know, $52 billion sounds like a lot, but it's really not for, for all the work that the State Department does and all that it's asked to do and how complicated the world is. You know, for me, I see diplomacy as our enduring tool of first resort, especially at a time when uh, power is, is diffusing when there are new disruptive technologies that are rapidly changing the global landscape. And when, as I said earlier, there are just too many problems that will require global cooperation. And, and to do that effectively, you need a strong State Department and you need international leadership so that you're pushing on an open door with allies uh, when we come calling to, to talk about issues that really matter to us. So all of this is interconnected and I really hope we can do a lot more to tell these stories 
to Americans because I think it's it's a great story to tell. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I I would agree with that. Uh, we do have a, a question that came in from uh, Andrew Lim. Uh, if he'd like to uh, ask, I'm going to make sure he's unmuted and he's welcome to ask his question. Andrew, go ahead. Yes, hello, can, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you yes. so much. Uh, so my question was, as the world has become increasingly globalized, uh, embracing cultural diversity has apparently become a necessary factor in our foreign relations. And I was wondering if you had uh, any stories from your career about how you connect with others different from your background to promote the importance of diplomacy, uh, especially regarding things such as the counterfactual mentioned earlier that you know cannot always be measured pragmatically? Yeah, thanks a lot, because I, I really think this question of, of uh, diversity is really important at home and abroad. And so let me just start on the home front. You know, I think part of the, the mission of the State Department has to be that it looks like the country it represents. And that means diversity really matters, inclusion matters at the State Department. And, and right now, I think we could be doing a lot better to make sure that uh, other voices and other people are represented uh, at the State Department. Uh, that's, you know, I think if you look at the numbers, uh, the number of African-Americans and Hispanics uh, at the State Department uh, is, is below uh, labor force participation rates, same for women. I think the numbers are the same today as they were in 2000, and we have to do a better job of making sure that the department reflects the country. Uh, and that's gonna be important, not just because it's the right thing to do, but also because uh, it's, the, it's the values that we carry to the world, and we wanna make sure that we're, we're representing that. So that, that'd be point number one. The second is that I do think uh, that one of the special things about being a, a speech writer uh, first in the Senate and then the State Department is an interesting shift that I saw. One is that when you're in the Senate, you are writing for a senator or a member of the House, and your your their constituency is, is, is who you're writing for. You may be writing for a prominent member of Congress and you speak to national concerns, but each person uh, represents a constituency, and that's your that's your audience. Uh, and so when you're thinking about this, uh, you mentioned earlier, logos, ethos, pathos. You know, when you're thinking about ethos, how you characterize yourself, you're often characterizing yourself for a particular segment in the community. If you go from there to the State Department, you realize your ethos is the country. You're characterizing America's story to the world. Uh, and that's a very different uh, message. And it's a really powerful message to try to convey. And one of the things that was so interesting is that when we would travel overseas, Often what we would end up doing is not just telling America's story to the world, but we would be researching and learning about another country's story and then telling that back to them in a speech as a sign of respect. It seems counterintuitive to go overseas and sort of tell another country what, how you see its story, but this is really part of the magic of diplomacy. And this is what Secretary Kerry used to always tell me, which is the art of diplomacy as seeing another country, not only through your own eyes, but through their eyes, through the eyes of, the peop of their people. And so you remember where you come from, you know, but you also try to see things from a different perspective. And so having a sort of a sense of, uh, of empathy, but also a reversibility of perspectives really matters for good diplomacy. Uh, I can just share uh, one example. Uh, we were, I was, remember working on a speech with Secretary Kerry about Afghanistan. Uh, and it was sort of at a moment where we were really thinking about the transition there. And there were sort of three components of this transition, a political, an economic, and a security transition. And we found uh, Secretary Kerry had met with Afghan women leaders uh, in, in Afghanistan, and he remembered their stories. Uh, and so he integrated them into the speech. And for every transition, we told the story uh, of an Afghan woman leader, uh, one who had set up her own trucking company with just, a, I think, one or two trucks in the beginning, and then she had hundreds of trucks uh, not long thereafter, and it was really an incredible story. For each one, we told the story of how these women saw the transition, what was at stake. Uh, and I, and many, many Afghan women leaders were in the audience at Georgetown listening to this speech. Uh, and I think, uh, I think it really resonated. And at the end of the speech, uh, speaking of sort of the transfer of knowledge from one generation to the next, uh, Secretary Kerry wanted to include a line from a letter that a young Afghan girl had written him. And she wrote him this very moving letter that he read on the flight back from Kabul. And one of the lines, uh, one line in that letter really stood out to him, which is she said, I want to be one of them. And she was talking about sort of the future uh, Afghan women leaders in her country. And so he, he took that line, he remembered it, and he put it in the speech. And it was, I thought, a, a moving symmetry to see 
you know, here is a, a young Afghan girl who is now looking up to the future that, that all Afghan women were trying to build together with their other citizens in, in Afghanistan. And that to me is, is an example where uh, America is trying to tell the stories of the world and, and just share its values. And it was a way to try to connect. And I do think sometimes <laughs> As Edward Murrow wrote, you know, it's bridging that last three feet in the communications chain, one person talking to another. Uh, and that's sometimes where the best diplomacy happens. Uh, you know, it, it's personal. And so that, that, that really matters. And I saw that uh, as a speechwriter. And I, you know, I still see that today as someone who's now outside of the State Department uh, and looking at our, at our foreign policy. Excellent. Thank you for the question, Andrew. That was a, a good answer. Andrew, we have a, another question from uh, Carol, who I think has been unmuted. Carol, you're welcome to, uh, to ask your question. Oh, right th thank you very much, Mark. Uh, nice to meet you, Ambry, and to learn about your book, Andrew. Um, I wondered, I spent most of my career in information technology. So I'm, first, I was just double checking, is the job of diplomacy, as you see it, still facilitating communication between countries, exploring ways to solve world problems together. Um, and also, how can we rethink the department's information technology resources to better do the job? I got a misspelling there of diplomacy. Uh, that was my question. Well, thank you, thank you so much uh, for the question. I really appreciate it. And one of the things that I would say is that you know, it's really interesting, you know, for me, by my lights, you know, the core, the core mission of the department is building those relationships, you know, monitoring, reporting, communicating, uh, and, and those are core tasks that are really important to the mission of diplomacy, which is really about managing relations with other countries, mitigating risks, and seizing opportunities in the world. And technology, I think, has to play a really important part uh, of that conversation. Uh, technology is a means, not an end. And so I think it's important to ask person, well, what, what are the goals that we're trying to achieve in the world? What does America really want to see? Uh, and once we figure that out, then the question is, well, in a world where technology is becoming more and more important, where things are moving faster, and where technology is a critical enabler of our innovation at home, but also of our national security, how can we stay at the cutting edge? And what role is there for the State Department in matters of technology? And I think you, you've rightly raised, I think, one of those important questions, which is, well, first, you know, how do we uh, modernize our IT capabilities? How do we make sure that uh, those management and HR functions are working effectively? Is there an opportunity to think creatively about this? So I focus on uh, artificial intelligence in my day-to-day -day job at Georgetown. And one of the interesting things about AI, as it is in its sort of modern incarnation, uh, is that many, many of the back office functions, uh, AI can be really useful for. This is the payroll, financing, HR. Uh, and so there are opportunities to think about how we can use AI more effectively for that, recognizing that uh, we have to be mindful of the safety and security concerns with AI, with concerns about bias, uh, and concerns about how it's integrated into systems, because AI itself is, is an enabling technology. It's a general purpose technology. And so you have to think about AI plus, AI in integrated into what systems and how do we use it? So I think there's a role for thinking about how we modernize our IT capabilities. But then we have to think about, well, what is the role of, of technology policy in our diplomacy and how can we do it more effectively? There are a lot of people thinking about this at the State Department right now. It's something I think about a lot from the outside. Uh, and one of the things that I think we need to really focus on is how can we uh, work more effectively with our allies on technology policy? How can we set the standards for things like AI and 5G? How can we uh, pursue collaborative research and development uh, together to push the curve of discovery? What more can we do to build a digital capacity uh, consistent with our, our democratic values and, and, and fragile democracies around the world? Uh, there's a whole agenda to pursue. Uh, and I think one of the core goals has to be, you know, how, do, how do we make sure the future of technology uh, reflects and benefits democratic values. And that's a big agenda. And I think that's an agenda that the State Department has an important leadership role on. And so I'm really glad that you asked this. I think there's sort of an internal set of questions about how state can modernize its IT capabilities. And then there's an external question about how we can leverage technology uh, to safeguard our values and interests in the world. 
So it's a really exciting area uh, and happy to take any more questions about it. Yeah, it was a good question. Thank you for that, Carol. It, uh, it kind of leads us to another question that goes even broader than, than technology that was submitted uh, in writing. So uh, we'll go back to it. It's about COVID-19. And what do you believe historians will say about COVID-19? And in particular, the, uh, the question is about China. Uh, the United States, of course, you mentioned trade earlier. There's a, uh, an imbalance of trade. Uh, the U.S. owes a lot of money to China. Uh, there's been uh, talk through this uh, administration uh, in terms of assigning blame or looking at uh, the effects of uh, the new coronavirus. Should the U.S. seek restitution for this? And what is really the role, I think, more broadly of, of, of China and with regard to uh, as we move forward, it's a global pandemic that's affected everyone. What are your thoughts about how that uh, affects uh, our international relations? I think, you know, when I, uh, as someone who cares about history, one of my first instincts on this kind of question is to go back and think about how other countries have failed and what we've failed and what we've seen before. And one of the things that you see if you go back into the deep history uh, is that uh, pandemics have a way of reordering international politics, whether that was during the Peloponnesian War in, in 430 BC, uh, a plague came and really sort of upended uh, Athens' military. It, it, it took uh, Pericles' life. Uh, you see it again uh, with, the, with the Black Death in Europe and what it did to wage structures, what it did to the Mongol Empire. Uh, you see it again in uh, this early 17th century in Venice uh, and how it... Uh, it really sped the rise of Venice's competitors. You know, Venice at the time was a great seafaring power and then uh, it was eventually overtaken by the British and the Dutch. So pandemics have a way of having long-term implications. I think the question today, is, are we gonna see those kinds of dramatic impacts? We've already seen sort of the tragedy unfolding before us. Uh, you know, over 215,000, uh, 220,000 Americans have have died, uh, many more have been infected, and then the numbers are even, even greater around the world. And we're seeing now a whole series of, uh, of difficult uh, measures being put into place uh, to try to contain the virus in Europe. Uh, so it's, it's certainly a, a seismic event. I think one of the things that has been driven home clearly for me uh, is that this is not just an epidemiological virus. It's a, it's a social virus, a political virus, an economic virus. I think in many ways, COVID held up a mirror uh, to our society and revealed uh, some troubling truths about our divisions, about our inequality, about the divide between urban and rural. And so there's a whole renewal project at home that we have to get right to rebuild our social compact and to make sure that we have uh, you know, education and healthcare uh, for everybody and to make sure that we are uh, preparing for the next pandemic. And I think in part that means are recognizing that uh, these, these happen with some frequency and uh, we need to make sure that we're investing uh, in priorities according to sort of a sense of risk. And so if we look right now what we spend, one, one number I saw was that we spend about 180 billion on counterterrorism and just two or three billion on infectious disease. You know, we all know that terrorism remains a persistent threat. It has to be uh, one of our priorities, but it's not the only priority. We have many priorities to manage. And what do you do with a virus that can shut down a whole economy and take that many American lives? We have to make sure that we're investing accordingly in pandemic preparedness and response, uh, thinking about our supply chains, thinking about our national strategic stockpile and learning from other countries. I mean, there are over 190 natural experiments going on right now around the world about how countries are managing this. And I think we have a lot to learn from other countries about how how they're dealing with it and how we can prepare uh, for the next one to make sure that we don't see these kinds of devastating impacts. Now, one of the uh, sort of geopolitical aftershocks uh, in a way is, is this question of US-China relations. And I think in many ways, what we've seen is that the pandemic has accelerated a lot of pre-existing trends that were troubling on the home front, but also in our foreign relations. And one of them is uh, the deteriorating US-China relationship. And I think a big question for, for anybody caring about foreign policy is how do we shape a deteriorating US-China relationship and manage it in a way that safeguards American values and interests and those of our allies and partners, but also doesn't court disaster or forfeit the opportunity to cooperate 
when and where we need to to deal with global problems like climate change or healthcare, so um, or pandemics. And so it's really this is this sort of a seminal challenge for for this generation and the next generation of diplomats. Uh, I'll just say a brief word about this. Um, you know, I do think again I would sort of lean on humility about this because uh, there's a lot that's uncertain, a lot that could change. I think certainly both the United States and China have stumbled in different ways. Uh, and you know what we're seeing now is China's economic growth is kicking back up, uh, and uh, it's they're a formidable uh, competitor uh, to the United States. Uh, and so, what can we do to help manage this? Well, you know, it won't surprise you that I think one of the first things we need to do is rediscover the virtues of, of alliances and realize that many uh, countries, while they may have some different perspectives on China, you know, are are partners for us on this challenge on trade. Uh, on security questions, on human rights, on a whole host of issues. And I think we need to be really reaching out to our allies and developing these relationships to implement what I call a shaping strategy. I think you know, too often, as one of our former Deputy Secretaries of State, Bill Burns has said, too, you know, we try to shape the internal trajectory of China. And I don't think we have much leverage or influence over that. But where we do have influence is to shape, as he said, the environment into which it rises. And the way we do that, I think, is to really work with our allies and partners uh, in the region to help them uh, shape uh, a regional order that is less China-centric, that has a different kind of equilibrium, that we get back in the game on high standard trade agreements. Uh, and we do so in a way that supports our middle class, that we backstop investments uh, that are happening in Southeast Asia to make sure that they're high standard and that we have a credible alternative, and that we're setting standards for new technologies like AI and 5G. I think these are all elements of an approach that could help shape this environment in a way that uh, supports democratic values and supports our interests and those of our allies and partners. And I think it's realistic. I think it's a way that we can do so that's consistent with our, our resources. Because right now, one of the things we haven't talked about is, you know, we are, uh, you know, our, our deficits and debt are, are rapidly increasing. Uh, and we have to be mindful of the fiscal constraints, but we also have to be mindful of the need to invest right now wisely in so many areas that will help strengthen our economic competitiveness and resilience. And I just say this to close out on it. Uh, you know, I think that the China challenge, as it's called, it begins at home. It begins with the investments that we make in ourselves. And it begins with recognizing that if we are in a contest of models, that we have to uh, stand strong for our own. We have to, we have to live up to the high standards of the democracy. And we have to make sure that we're leading with our values. So I think making sure that we lead with our values, invest in our strengths, uh, link arms with allies, and then think about areas where there is pragmatic uh, opportunities for cooperation on these global challenges that every single country has to be involved in in solving, like climate change. So it's a really a big, busy agenda. And I think COVID in many ways just accelerates it and creates a, a lot of new challenges. So uh, we'll have to, I think, again, have wise statecraft and have investments in our diplomacy to really navigate. So true, so true, and and thank you for that. That was uh, not only enlightening, but I, I would say just overall. I'm, uh, unfortunately, I, I see that we're we're out of time. But on behalf of ADST and all of us, I, I just want to thank you, Andrew Embry, for sharing your important and and highly relevant insights with us today. Uh, everyone out there, Andrew's book, Power on the Precipice: The Six Choices America Faces in a turbulent world is available now in bookstores and via Amazon. Uh, really appreciate your time and your insight. This book will be a useful resource, I think, for students of history and diplomatic practitioners, academians, uh, policymakers alike. Uh, finally, just a, a plug for us, if you value history and the lessons it has for us and appreciate ADST's Foral, Foreign Affairs Oral History Program, which is the largest collection of diplomatic uh, oral histories anywhere, we invite you to visit us at adst.org, learn about how you can support the work of a small and dedicated team and uh, capture, preserve, and share the history of America's diplomats. So we look forward to your participation at other events. Thank you again. The event is officially over now, but in keeping with our tradition, uh, you're welcome to stay on and chat as time permits, but uh, the recording will end officially. So thanks again, Andrew. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much. It was really a pleasure.